Buona giornata. Incominciamo la Let's seconda sessione. The ses second session. Dalla densa e by the ieri, wonderful che ci ha day that we experienced yesterday. Carismatico salesiano del we metodo the great preventivo e che oggi dobbiamo mettere a confronto educational con le method of the Salesian system and that we have to consider at a global level oggi. today. So considering which are the challenges for education today, globali, these are global challenges, so we will listen to our uh, speakers who come from all over the world, uh, bringing their own experience in this. Let's Please, uh, let's invite here on the la stage the President Paola Giulia Nicola, Paola Di Nicola, co-director of the, the magazine Prospettiva Persona, the magazine, Prospettiva Persona Perspective on the Person, Marta Seide and Marta Seide of the Pontifical Faculty of Educational Sciences, Auxilium of Rome. Buongiorno a Good tutti. Good morning, everybody. E a tutti. <laughs> to all, ladies and gentlemen. Ascoltiamo il saluto. Let's now listen to the... Greetings, initial greetings of the President. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to... Can you hear me? Okay, I want to share with you my joy for being here. It's a great honor also. It's a joy because I see a lot of colleagues, students, who have now grown up, of course. Well, and it's a great occasion for thanking you for the great work carried out by the Salesian family and the Salesian sisters with whom I have a strong relationship. I don't want to uh, mention all of you, maybe, maybe Sister Nicola, with whom I had a great relationship, uh, and President Suarerica Rosanna, Sister Rosanna. And there are many of you which I would like, whom I would like to thank, uh, of of course, I would like to thank you one by one. I would like to thank you for what you gave me and what you gave to my husband also during his uh, our teaching years. The session regards the challenges of education nowadays. I would like to underline three main challenges also considering what others will uh, say after me. The first challenge which appears to be important is uh, regarding the, yes, we change uh, everyday life. Uh, Postmodern life makes it uh, difficult to take uh, concrete decisions like wedding, uh, virginal consecration, becoming priest and uh, the profession, the work that you will do. This uh, difficulty pushes to change uh, very quickly, leaving open all the opportunities for any possible ways out, let's say. The risk is to reach at the end of the life still waiting for a solution. It's better to have a, a, a strong position so to properly act and have a precise way of act, acting. For every people is not easy to find the balance with himself, herself, the family, and the changing world. Our decisions are demanding, and so we have to do something for someone, also taking into account the, of the circumstances, the talents, and the expectations of others is a great expectation. 
uh, regarding educators uh, trying to capture the indicators, the indications which are more feasible. Feasible. I always remember Michelangelo who said that he didn't get married in order to follow his artistic vocation. And he said, I have a, a big wife and it's art, an art that it's making a lot of troubles inside my soul and my kids will be my works. Then dialogue, which kind of dialogue? This is the apri between identity and authority, a plural world which is also multi-ethnic and multi-religious one cannot bear individuals which are just blocked in their convictions, passive executors of slogans and ideas and evangelizers of my profession. Prefabricated, pre uh, pre made responses uh, and pre made ideologies uh, are not good in this case because an educator, if he wants to be efficient, must earn the trust of the students, of people sharing the questions and the doubts of the others, so to give his, his, best, his or her best and getting the best of the others. The youth are forced by public opinion to consider that the best people are those who live on the basis of one like. Uh, well, to this youth, we want to say that we have to awaken their soul and urge them to start over and over again every day. Your value is great, and it's even greater than whatever you have done so far. Ecology of the soul, this is the third challenge regarding the apory between faith and atheism. Social indicators and cultural indicators uh, envisages uh, some problems in the faith, uh, atheism, agnosticism, indifference, refusal and rejection of the church of all those who abuses of God making the most of the power, prestigious uh, and sacral apparatus, the suspicion, which is uh, fostered by scandals, uh, involves all religions. The educator cannot stand beyond all the doubts, temptations, uh, abandonment, feelings. Uh, in order to be close to the other, he has to be. At the, in the search of the truth every day and try others to clean their awareness and remove all the false beliefs in the name of a spiritual ecology, also an environmental ecology, and building good relations, a human ecology. I can't believe that we could be ever able to educate without facing all the uh, generational troubles and problems that we have to deal with as mothers. These times, According to Bishop Hammerleck, uh, described like this, Hammerleck was uh, telling about his travel to Santa Sofia in Turkey, and he said, in the big chapel, we have seen big writings taken from the Holy Quran. Some writings said it is forbidden to pray. Immediately there, in the same chapel, an ancient mosaic was saying Mary, was showing Mary offering her soul. There, I clearly understood. Yeah, this is the church. Being there, being here, starting from you, yourself, for generating God, that God which nowadays looks to be absent. This is why I said, it's necessary to resort to a Christian, a Christian religion which is much more inspired to Mary. So I wish you a great day uh, giving back the floor to Sor Marta. Sister Marta, thank you so much.
Grazie. Thank you. Rapidamente richiamo il, in, lo scopo di questa seconda sessione a confronto con le sfide all'educazione oggi. Innanzitutto vogliamo in prendere consapevolezza di alcune sfide trasversali presenti nel vissuto contemporaneo che hanno una forte incidenza sulla mentalità e sui comportamenti di un singolo e della collettività individuals and the collectivity and especially regarding the youth and educators. This awareness of uh, all the different situations is extremely important to be uh, analyzed and this is exactly what we will do in the morning while in the afternoon we will talk about the anthropology. First we will start now with a short video which is extremely interesting. Quella che stiamo vivendo non è semplicemente un'epoca di cambiamenti, ma è un cambiamento d'epoca. Forze ambientali, antropologiche, tecnologiche stanno trasformando velocemente il modo di vivere, le relazioni, l'interazione con la realtà. Consumo di risorse non rinnovabili, emissioni clima alteranti, spreco e rifiuti inquinanti. La Terra è in deficit ecologico. Costruire un futuro a zero emissioni con tecnologie green e stili di vita più sostenibili è fondamentale. Mentre una parte dell'umanità vive nell'opulenza, un'altra vede i propri diritti violati. Un bambino su tre sotto i cinque anni è denutrito o in sovrappeso. 60 milioni di essi rischieranno la vita in assenza di interventi adeguati. Il 13% della popolazione mondiale vive in estrema povertà. Se in Medio Oriente una persona sopravvive con meno di 2 dollari al giorno, in Europa se ne spendono almeno 30 pro capite. L'istruzione è un diritto da difendere. Ancora molti minori vivono nei disagi delle guerre. Non hanno pari opportunità. Non raggiungono livelli adeguati di competenze. E dal primo lockdown non sono più tornati in classe. La privazione e la libertà di gioco sono due facce della stessa medaglia. I minori costretti ai lavori forzati sono in crescita, così come chi si aggrega nel cortile digitale. Dedicando sempre meno tempo libero all'attività fisica. L'intelligenza artificiale sta cambiando la percezione dello spazio, del tempo e del corpo. A prendere decisioni importanti sono l'uomo e l'algoritmo insieme. Una relazione tutta da esplorare, con effetti sull'identità, le conoscenze, la socializzazione, la produttività, il superamento dei limiti fisici. Come figlie di Maria Ausiliatrice, da 150 anni accompagniamo le giovani generazioni formandole ed evangelizzandole nei diversi contesti di crescita. Ancora oggi nasce per noi un'urgenza, comprendere per educare a una nuova esperienza di vita. Bene. 
Okay. So it was a great introduction uh, before starting our day. So let's now start as the president said before. Uh, our speakers today are connected, uh, remotely connected. We have only one person here who will speak in presence. And now we invite uh, Professor Quentin Woodon. Let's see if he appears on the video on the screen. Good morning. We so thank you, thank you for joining us in this uh, day. All the speakers uh, of today's work are extremely important persons, so we would need a lot of time to introduce them, but unfortunately we have, don't have so much time. So I will just spend a few words about them. So as to uh, Professor Wooden, uh, I also said in Italian, if we look at the program, he is lead economist of the World Bank. American University, at the Georgetown University, ha conseguito solo per dire quattro dottorati e ha più di 500 pubblicazioni. E di recente ha anche lanciato il progetto Global Catholic Education. Uh, we are sorry, the English boot is uh, sorry for a technical problem. We are unable to translate this part sull'educazione per lo sviluppo umano integrale in tempo di crisi e ha voluto pensarlo proprio come spunti per il 150 anniversario dell'istituto. A voi la parola. Please take the floor. And after 40, 45 minutes, we will continue. It will be a long speech. Please take the floor. Thank you, uh, Sister Marta. So um, I have prepared remarks. Um, so normally I would present a PowerPoint with lots of graphics and numbers. Uh, but today I will try to do this differently because we have a translation and, and I will uh, just follow uh, the prepared remarks uh, that Sister Marta uh, asked me to um, share. Um, I'm going to have a presentation that is going to be very uh, simple. Um, and uh, the idea is just for you to be able to uh, follow where uh, do I stand uh, in those uh, remarks. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, Education for Integral uh, Human Development at the Time of Crisis. Um, so let me actually uh, go to the text. Let me start. So for 150 years, as daughters of Mary Help of Christians, you have provided education uh, with a particular focus on girls from vulnerable backgrounds. You have changed millions of lives. Um, and over the last two years, I had the opportunity to interview several members of your congregation. Uh, Sister Patricia Paraguez Nunez in Chile, uh, Sister uh, Josephine Chulu in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sister Mikarin Kade in Haiti, Sister Anesi Odate and Sister Marta Sede in Italy, uh, Sister Josephine uh, Gaza and Sister uh, Maria Victoria Sta Anna in the Philippines, and finally Sister Sarah Garcia in Switzerland. Uh, these sisters and all of you are doing extraordinary work, often with limited resources, and I'm honored to have been invited to participate in your Congress 
And I hope that uh, the Congress will be a source of inspiration, uh, not only for the continuation of your own work, uh, but also uh, for the work of others uh, who share uh, your passion in education. Um, and I can see actually before continuing that uh, the slides uh, do not seem to move. Uh, so maybe I'll just uh, stop sharing and uh, uh, it would be perhaps easier for you to follow uh, what I'm doing. So we live in a challenging time marked by wars, uh, climate change, heightened competition and a lack of resources for education. For today's session, the organizers asked me to share a few thoughts on some of the challenges that we face and how they may affect school and universities as well as children and youth. Now, I work for an international uh, development agency. Uh, so let's just mention and emphasize that my remarks today emerge from my voluntary work on Catholic education. Uh, they only reflect my own views and uh, they do not necessarily reflect the views of my employer, its executive directors or uh, the countries they represent. I have been given uh, 45 minutes to share thoughts on those themes, um, after which we will have discussions and a broader exchange of views and experiences. So let me try to share at least some nuggets of information that I hope will be useful for you. I will structure my presentation around seven topics. The lack of sufficient progress towards ensuring quality for all, first topic. The second topic is the potential impact of the current overlapping crises that are affecting much of the world. The third topic is the importance of education, especially for girls. The fourth topic is the need for a stronger focus on improving learning in school. The fifth topic is the importance of including a focus on values in education. Next, I will briefly discuss the contribution of Catholic and other faith-based education providers to education systems and the issue of education pluralism. And finally, at the end, I will share a few opportunities for Catholic schools and universities which are related to alumni engagement, service learning, and the global footprint of Catholic education. So that's a long agenda, but let me start with uh, the first topic, the lack of progress uh, towards the fourth sustainable development goal, the education goal. Globally, uh, according to data from the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, which are available in the World Bank's World Development Indicators, nine in 10 children complete their primary education and three in four complete their lower secondary education. In low-income countries, however, despite some progress over the last two decades, only two thirds, 67% of children complete their primary education and less than 40% complete lower secondary school. The latest estimates from UNESCO suggest that 24, 244 million children remain out of school, with the number of out of school children increasing in Sub Saharan Africa. As a congregation, you have a particular interest in educating girls and more generally, in providing them with better opportunities in life. So girls have caught up with boys for primary education completion rates in most countries. But they continue to lag behind boys at the secondary level in many low-income countries. This is due in part to the high prevalence in those countries of both child marriage which is defined as marrying before the age of 18, and early childbearing, which is defined as having a first child before the age of 18. 
While some countries are making progress more than others, especially in South Asia, progress is much too slow to achieve the targets for SDG4, especially again in Sub-Saharan Africa. The poor and vulnerable continue to be left behind with major implications for their opportunities later in life. Now, apart from low levels of educational attainment in many countries, children suffer from a global learning crisis. With too many students, especially again in the developing world, not acquiring the foundational skills that education systems should provide. Based on data from international and regional student assessments, simulation suggests that today, in part because of the COVID-19 pandemic, seven in 10 children aged 10 in low and middle income countries may not be able to read and understand a simple text. That is seven out of 10 children. While many children are at risk of dropping out and not learning enough while in school, children in extreme poverty are especially at risk. Another group at risk that uh, I would like to mention is children with disabilities. While primary and secondary education completion rates increased for all children over the last few decades, including the poorest, small gains were achieved for children with disabilities. And this has led to larger gaps between children with and without disabilities over time. Let me shift to the second of the topics I wanted to discuss, which is overlapping crises and challenges. The organizers of the Congress asked me to reflect on some of the societal trends that affect how we think about education and some of the factors that are contributing to that lack of progress towards achieving the targets set for in the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, we are facing a set of overlapping crises and challenges that have implications for education systems as a whole, and also for Catholic schools and universities in particular. So let me mention six of those crises and challenges. The first is the worsening learning crisis due to the pandemic. As already mentioned, simulations based on data from student assessments suggest that in low and middle income countries, seven in 10 children aged 10 are not able to read and understand a simple text. Before the pandemic, that estimate was at just one in two students. School closures during the pandemic have had a devastating effect on learning, especially in poorer countries, where quality distance learning was not a viable option. Again, especially when most families did not have connectivity to the internet, including families with children in Catholic schools. Importantly, the learning crisis is likely to affect children in Catholic as well as public schools. I will come back to some of the programs and policies that could help improve learning later in the context uh, that I will discuss, but let me briefly mention some of the over other overlapping crises that uh, we are currently facing. The second is rising inflation. The policy responses to inflation and the risks for unemployment and poverty. Inflation was already substantial before the start of the war in Ukraine. 
but the war has further disrupted commodity markets, leading to higher prices, especially for energy and food. The measures taken to fight inflation in high-income countries may lead the global economy to fall into a recession, according to a recent World Bank report. In turn, this could possibly lead to financial crisis in emerging markets and developing economies. And this report suggests that the global economy may face its worst downturn since the 1970s. And that was a period during which policy responses to high inflation led to stagflation, which is a combination of high inflation, low growth, and high unemployment. And this could lead to severe debt crisis in many developing economies. Such a scenario could lead many more households to fall into poverty, which would affect their ability to send their children to school. A global recession may also affect the sustainability of some Catholic schools in countries where the schools do not benefit from state funding and therefore rely on tuition paid by parents to cover their operating costs. This is because when households are affected by shocks that reduce their incomes, they may need to shift their children from private to public schools. The third crisis is rising debts and constraints budgets. So many countries have accumulated debt at unsustainable levels in recent years. Measures to combat inflation, in particular in the United States, are exacerbating the debt crisis faced by these countries. Interest rates are rising and this leads to higher debt payments for loans that are not, as we say in technical terms, in consensual terms. And without getting too technical, the rise in the value of the dollar and the perception of the US as a safe haven for investments is also affecting exchange rates. But countries have to pay back what they borrow in dollars. And given these debt obligations, <clears throat> as well as the risk of lower tax revenues in a recession, the need to fund safety nets, all of this means that the availability of resources for the education sector is limited. A recent report from UNESCO and the World Bank suggests that the pandemic led to larger gaps between the actual and the required investments in education. And about 40% of low and lower middle income countries have actually reduced public spending for education since the onset of the pandemic. The data also suggests that donors have decreased aid for education as they had to prioritize support for health and social protection. And efforts to mitigate the consequences of the war in Ukraine. The fourth crisis is related to conflicts, climate change, and forcibly displaced people. So the war in Ukraine has exacerbated the refugee crisis. Uh, UNHCR, the agency of the UN for refugees, estimates that at the end of 2021, 89 million people were forcibly displaced. This is more than twice the level of a decade ago. And for refugees specifically, more than two thirds came from just five countries, um, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. But that was before the start of the war in Ukraine. Right now, UNHCR estimates that as of June 2022, there were more than 100 million people who were forcibly displaced. And that forced displacement crisis may well worsen in coming decades, in particular due to the impact of climate change. 
educating the children who are forcibly displaced is going to be a massive challenge. I have two more challenges that I want to mention. The number five challenge is about labor markets and the changing nature of work. That's a broader challenge. It relates to the implication of how work is changing for education systems and whether we are able to provide the skills that children and youth will need to have to have decent jobs. Now, there's a lot of fear of job displacement from technology and artificial intelligence, and those may be overstated, <clears throat> as technology could also bring new job opportunities. But the changing nature of work implies that workers need to become more team-oriented problem solvers who can adapt to changing circumstances. Typically, schools have emphasized cognitive skills and the mastery of subject-specific knowledge. But social-emotional skills, which relate to how we behave, including how we motivate ourselves and how we interact with others, are going to become more important. And high-order cognitive and social behavioral skills are what will be needed more and more in labor markets. Enabling children to acquire these skills will require investments from an early age, especially from, for disadvantaged groups. Now, it is sometimes suggested that an emphasis on the performance of the students in learning as it is measured through national or international standardized student assessment that, that emphasis is misplaced, as it may lead to overemphasizing cognitive skills and success on examinations to the detriment of social emotional skills. But rather than putting one set of skills against the other, we need to recognize that both are needed and may reinforce each other. Success in one area actually helps students to achieve success in the other. And the fact that schools need to prepare students for the labor market is unescapable. Now, finally, as a last challenge, and this is from the point of view of Catholic schools and universities, <clears throat> I should mention the challenge of secularization. Let me take the example of the United States, where enrollment in Catholic schools has declined for more than half a century. A recent report from the Pew Research Centers looks at trends in religious affiliations in the country. And in 2021, less than two thirds of the population identified as Christian versus 78% in, in 2007. So it's a large drop of about 15 percentage points in just a few years. And apart from these broad trends towards secularization, the sex abuse scandal that has affected the Catholic Church may also have contributed to lower enrollment in Catholic schools. So what I've done so far is mention some of the challenges that we have towards the sustainable, goal, sustainable development goal in education and some of the crises that are the challenge that we face today. Since you focus on education for girls, let me mention that there are huge benefits from education, especially for girls. So I'm going to go through five or six of those benefits. And you know them, but I think it's useful to think again about those. The first benefit is about labor market earnings and poverty reduction. So education is essential, and you know that, to escape poverty. But according to estimates, <clears throat> men and women with a primary education earn only 20% to 30% more in the labor market on average 
than those with no education at all. And those impacts are observed actually only when the children learn something in school, and many children do not learn enough in school. The larger returns to education are observed at the secondary and tertiary level. And so it's essential that we find ways to enable the children not only to complete primary education, but also to go to secondary school or tertiary education. When you go to secondary or tertiary education, you also have a higher chance of participating in the labor market and a lower likelihood of unemployment. Now, because labor earnings are the key for households to avoid poverty, clearly improving education has the potential to reduce poverty dramatically, but again, primary school is necessary, but not enough. A second area where education matters for girls specifically is child marriage, fertility, and women's health. So poor education and our outcomes have negative effects for men and women, but for girls, if you drop out of school, you are much more likely <clears throat> to marry before the age of 18 or have children at an age when you're not yet ready to do so. And child marriage and early childbearing in turn leads to a wide range of negative consequences for girls and their children. It turns out that keeping girls in school is the best way to end child marriage and early childbearing. Each additional year that a girl spends in school is associated with a reduction in the risk of child marriage and early childbearing. And you could make an argument that <clears throat> universal secondary education for girls could virtually end child marriage. Now, women who have children too early tend to have more children over their lifetime. And that affects fertility rates and population growth with potential effects for countries. And this is a bit of a sensitive topic perhaps, but we can discuss it in the discussion if you would like. Now, by reducing the risk of child marriage and early childbearing and providing agency for women, Education could help women make choices on how many children they would like to have and reduce fertility and population growth. And this would generate a demographic transition and what we call a demographic dividend. This is fundamental to raise standards of living and reducing poverty. And of course, <clears throat> education for girls and women has a large effect on women's health knowledge their ability to seek care and their psychological well-being. It also helps to reduce the risk for women of intimate partner violence. Another benefit of the education for girls is for their children, and that relates to child health and nutrition. <clears throat> so it's clear that when the parents are better educated, their children will do better in school. But the education of the parents and the mothers specifically also has a large effect on health and nutrition. So the likelihood that a child will die by age four or that a child will be stunted, which is a measure of malnutrition, is lower if the mother is better educated. And finally, I want to mention agency and decision making. So better educated men and women have more agency in their life. Now agency is a complicated complex concept, but <clears throat> it's typically defined as the capacity to exercise choice. It depends on the environment, the policies, the regulation, the social norms, as well as whether men and women have access to specific resources. And it also depends on a person's past achievements, um, the level of confidence. Uh, of the person. Education has an impact on all of those aspects. And research suggests that 
if we were able to achieve universal secondary education, women's agency, so the ability of women to make decisions within their households in a wide range of areas would increase uh, substantially. There is one last thing I wanted to mention, which to me actually is very important, is uh, the issue um, of social capital um, and uh, the issue of altruism or altruistic behaviors. I mean, another benefit of education is that people who are better educated typically are more able to rely on friends when they are in financial needs and they are just in a better place in life, if you will. And something that I found fascinating um, is the fact that when you have more education, you are also more able to engage in altruistic behaviors, such as volunteering, donating to charity, helping strangers. And this is not, of course, because people who are better educated are intrinsically more altruistic than others. No. But it is because people who are more educated are in a position in life where they are more able to help others or more, they have more freedom, if you will, to volunteer, donate, help strangers. And to me, one of the largest um, violations, if you will, of the rights of people is for the poor that often they are in a difficult situation to be able to help others. They actually do, um, but, but they don't have the same opportunities as people who have um, a, a better place in life, if you will, because they are better educated. So let me move now to <clears throat> what is really important, and you're probably aware of this, but, but, but I'm not sure that everybody understands the severity of the learning crisis that we are facing. So I mentioned before that primary education is necessary, but it's not sufficient to enable children to thrive later in life. And for many of the development outcomes that I mentioned, a primary education actually does not make a huge difference versus no education at all. The, the gains that you see are really when the children reach secondary education. And of course, primary is needed for that. But part of the reason why primary education does not have a large impact is because many children do not learn in primary school. I mentioned earlier that the estimates currently are that seven in 10 children in low and middle income countries are not able to read and understand a simple text. This is for children aged 10. So what can be done to improve learning? Well, we need better pedagogy in the classroom. And, and part of your Congress is going to be about these kind of topics. Um, I was amazed by uh, Brother Peter Tabici, uh, who is a Franciscan, who is teaching in a public secondary school in Kenya. And he was the winner in 2019 of the Global Teacher Prize. And asked about how he teaches, he responded, it's all about having confidence in the student. But then in very practical ways, <clears throat> he's doing a lot of things that make the teaching much more concrete and, and understandable for students. So for example, he explained that as a science teacher, you need to improvise. He explained materials are very expensive for practicum. So I improvised picking up materials from surroundings. If I'm talking about a resistance for electricity, I can show a radio or another electrical gadget and explain how it is working or not working. And then the students appreciate how resistances work in practice. So we have to avoid learning to become too abstract or too conceptual. Now, at a broader level, uh, and this is research that is available, uh, five principles have been suggested to guide teacher policies. So we, may, we need to make teaching an attractive, an attractive profession. So the status of the teacher, uh, the pay of the teacher, the career progression, all of that has to be improved. We need to have <clears throat> a meritocratic selection of teachers uh, and probably a probationary period to improve the quality of the teachers. We need to ensure that pre-service education 
has a strong practicum so that teachers are equipped to transition and perform well in the classroom when they are appointed. And we need to provide continuous support and motivation through high quality in-service training and strong school leadership. And finally, <clears throat> we have to use technology wisely to enhance the ability of teachers to reach every student. Now, these are a bit broad, but under each of those, you could actually outline a number of very practical steps that the education system can take, and I think this applies to Catholic schools as well. Now, the culture that you have in the school is very important, and I think you will be very familiar with that since you work in Catholic schools and universities. And to me, the importance of school management can be illustrated um, with the example of the Fe Alegria, uh, Jesuit schools in Latin America. The schools perform very well. Uh, there are evaluations that show that uh, they often perform better than other types of schools. But one of the reasons for this is because each individual school has a high level of independence for generating and managing its resources. They have a great institutional climate. They emphasize the selection, tutoring, supervision, and training of teachers with mentoring between older and younger teachers. And they really adapt to their local realities and principles convey the mission of the schools to the teachers, to the students, and to the whole community. There's really a sense of purpose that you see in those schools, and I think this would apply a lot to your own schools. Finally, I think it's very important also to know that there is guidance <clears throat> on what might be cost-effective approaches to reduce the learning crisis or end it. I mentioned uh, a bit earlier that if you think about the education system as a whole, there is actually a lack of funding right now. And, and, and the picture for the future does not look too good in terms of the resources that will be available. So this means that one has to be very careful about how to invest. Now, one of the reports of the World Bank about those investments suggests that some investments are great and other investments are bad. So what are the great investments? Well, one of the most cost-effective interventions to improve learning is actually to provide <coughs> information to the families about the high returns to education, the benefits of education, and the quality of their school. Because then the families can have an effect potentially on how the school is managed. So information to parents about the quality of the school and the fact that there are a large benefit for children of going to school is very important. Because many parents, especially the poor, have to make financial sacrifices to enroll their children. Now, something that is very important, and this is really for low and middle income countries, is what we call structured pedagogy, combined with teacher training and learning materials. <clears throat> so too many teachers, including in Catholic schools in low income countries, do not master by any means what they need to teach to the children. And so we have to find ways to simplify the lectures and to provide structure for the teacher to really focus on foundational skills. We also need to teach the children at the right level. Uh, it's too often the case, again, mostly in low and middle income countries, that the teacher will teach at a high level, which is the level of the curriculum, but not at the level that the children actually understand. So we need to teach at the level that the children understand. Preschool education is also very important. So these are good investments. <clears throat> now there are some investments that are promising, uh, but for which we don't actually have a lot of empirical evidence that they work. 
Um, and some of the interventions um, for preschools like early stimulation and some of the interventions to improve school management are part of that. But you also have bad investments. And uh, this is typically investing in um, inputs, if you will, uh, into schools without other interventions. And the classic example is investing in computer hardware or other inputs without other complementary challenges that cost a lot of money and actually doesn't improve learning. Now, I don't think that in many of those schools that you manage, this happens, but it happens in too many schools. Now, I just want to mention also that um, uh, recently, uh, meaning a week ago, uh, UNESCO and uh, the whole system of the United Nations organized the uh, Transformi Transforming Education Summit uh, with a series of discussion papers and a series of resources that are very uh, useful. Um, for the translator, I'm going to go back up to um, uh, something I forgot to mention, uh, which is that um, there is also guidance <clears throat> about a broader vision for education. And I'll just mention that very briefly. Um, at the World Bank, we emphasize five priorities. Uh, learners need to be prepared and motivated to learn. Um, and this requires whole child development and support to learning beyond the school and also in the family. And some of what Pope Francis has been calling for under the Global Compact on Education Force in that. Uh, teachers, of course, need to be effective and valued. Um, the learning resources, the books, the curricula uh, needs to be uh, of high quality. Um, and again, uh, we have to make sure that this is at the level of the child and that we don't go too high, especially at the secondary school. Many curricula are too complicated, at least in, in some low income countries. Uh, schools need to be safe and inclusive. I mean, inclusivity relates to many aspects, um, including disability. Uh, safety relates to violence in school. Um, I mean, the, the, the level of violence in schools, including in Catholic schools, are very, very high. Um, about one child in two is a victim of violence in schools in one way or the other. And finally, you need to have uh, the right management of the systems. And, and there are a whole, hand, whole range of, of um, suggestions that can be made um, there. Now, let me talk briefly about the question of education and values. So this is probably an issue that you deeply care about. Um, the role of education system in promoting values. Uh, I also believe that this is very important and, and the whole concept of education for- Excuse education me, professor, is... you have 10 minutes. Thank Ten you. Minutes. Thank you, thank you, Sister Madam. So um, I just want them to go um, a bit fast about the values because I do want to go to the last section about some practical suggestions for you as well. Um, but, but in terms of the um, evidence, th there is a clear distinction between uh, the priorities that parents have for their children, um, for the parents who send their child to Catholic schools versus public schools versus other types of schools. And values matter more um, to parents uh, who send their children to um, Catholic schools. Now, I had remarks, um, uh, but I'm not going to go through them because it would take too long. But let me go to the, 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 the nuts and bolts, and maybe that's a discussion we can have later in the um, question and answer part. I am convinced that in many countries, um, beyond trying to uh, provide um, excellence in education and beyond faith formation, a top priority for Catholic schools is to emphasize values more in such a way that this is actually working for children who are not Catholic themselves. I won't say more here, um, but, but I wanted to raise uh, that point. Now, um, I had a section about the contribution um, of Catholic education, but I'm going too slowly, and Sister Marta called, told me to, to just uh, wrap up uh, quickly. Um, uh, there is a lot of information, including um, reports uh, that I've done for the Global Catholic Education Project, they're called the Global Catholic Education Reports, about uh, the contribution of uh, Catholic schools 
um, globally. Uh, you probably know that uh, more than 61 million students are in primary education, close to 7 million in universities. Um, what is important to note um, is that um, there is not necessarily always a systematic comparative advantage for Catholic schools versus other schools. Um, but I won't go in details in this. So let me finish with the seven or eight minutes I have left with three examples of opportunities that I wanted to mention to you. Um, the first one is the need to engage Catholic education alumni. Now, uh, in my remarks, which will be available to you um, in full, um, I explain uh, that Catholic schools and universities actually have a comparative advantage. Typically, um, the um, attachment of the alumni to their school or university is actually higher uh, for those who come from Catholic education than from public education, and, and there are reasons for that. Um, but I think that there are huge opportunities to try to involve alumni more, uh, both in universities and in schools. Uh, they can provide some funding, but much more importantly, uh, they can really help, um, for example, to prepare the students uh, to go to college or the transition to the labor market. Um, they can bring their own experience. Um, and there's a beautiful example, uh, and I can discuss it in the Q&A later, if, it, if there's a question of a school uh, in Burkina Faso um, uh, that uh, does a great job of, of linking with the community so that the, the, the community is brought into the school and especially the alumni. The second thing I wanted to mention um, is uh, the opportunity that you have to establish global connections. Uh, it's actually unique, uh, the fact that we have uh, Catholic schools and universities all over the world. But very few of them actually make systematic links with schools or universities in another country. And we have the technology, Zoom or other, to do that. And uh, there is a very nice project that I want to mention by the international Office of Catholic Education. It's called Planet Fraternity, where schools in different countries connect and, and work on, on themes which are related to the Sustainable Development Goals together. Uh, it's in English. Um, uh, you could participate, but, but, but we should make more of an effort uh, to have links between schools in different countries um, uh, when uh, there is a connectivity to do so. It is not very complicated to do, and it can bring a lot of benefits for the children. The last point I wanted to mention is uh, service learning. And I assume that most of you are familiar with the concept of service learning. Uh, in the Vademecum for the Global Compact on Education, it's actually mentioned specifically. Um, it's an approach to uh, teaching and learning that integrates community service uh, within the curriculum. It's, it's beneficial for students, it's beneficial for uh, teachers as well. And uh, Catholic schools and universities actually have, again, a comparative advantage. And there is a lot of work uh, going on, especially for the universities, um, on how to um, institutionalize uh, better uh, service learning into the curriculum. So these are three things uh, which I thought I would mention uh, because I believe that Catholic universities and Catholic schools can benefit from them, um, making more connections with the community through the alumni, uh, improving uh, service learning, and taking advantage of the global network of schools that you have. So let me conclude here. Um, I mean, uh, I will uh, skip some of my uh, concluding remarks because I think I'm, I'm at 10 minutes, but I, I want to congratulate you again for your 150th anniversary and all that you have achieved, and I have no doubt that you will continue to make a unique contribution. What I also hope is that somehow uh, what happens in your Congress uh, can be made available to other school networks, uh, because I think there is a lot uh, that uh, they can learn uh, from you. So I apologize that I went a bit perhaps too slowly or I had too much material, uh, but I hope that some of what I was able to share will uh, resonate with you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor. Et l'applaudissement vous fait voir comment qu'on apprécie, qu apprécie votre conférence. Et puis, on aura le temps d'y revenir avec le débat un peu plus tard. Donc, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Adesso sarebbe, abbiamo, volevamo prendere almeno cinque minuti prima dell'intervallo. It's uh, uh, night now, so thank you for waking up, for being with us. Uh, this second uh, session, as you can see um, on the program, uh, is entitled Respondent. These people will uh, talk for uh, 15 minutes each, but each of them will represent a continent so that we will get a general idea of all the continents. Uh, we asked them uh, something very difficult uh, uh, because 15 minutes are not s enough to represent the big reality of a continent. Uh, and they talk from uh, uh, different parts of the world in this conference, therefore they will help us in getting different views. We have spoken about the challenges uh, in the morning and now we will see how these challenges have different colors with different responses, uh, different approaches. So let's see if uh, Professor will appear, Professor Toro on the screen. Good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> according to your position. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and to be present in this on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of uh, uh, your institution. I would like to say a few words um, in the beginning because the assembly doesn't know what is the uh, Fundación Avina which is written uh, on the program. I will tell you in uh, your language so that you will better understand. I apologize. Professor Toro. Professor Toro is an assessor of the Fundación Avina. Please Google it so that you will get much more uh, details regarding this uh, uh, organization. He is founder and director of the Unista Educación Hoy, Perspectivas Latinoamericanas. He was a professor in several universities and assessors at the ministries of uh, communication and education in Colombia, uh, Brazil, and Mexico. He was the author of uh, many uh, publications focused mainly on the educational care. Today, he will uh, uh, talk from the point of view of uh, America regarding the challenges impacting uh, education and the ongoing processes. Uh, his uh, uh, speech will talk about uh, understanding uh, on how guiding uh, the new ethical paradigm of uh, education. Please take the floor. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. To all the, thanks to FMA. We are now uh, facing a paradox. On the one hand, we have created the conditions for disappearing as a species. At the same time, we have paved the way for uh, reaching a new humanization levels, uh, global warming, uh, water and uh, land pollution.
Muchas gracias, profesor. Y nos ha planteado en modo muy fuerte el paradigma del cuidado y pienso que tenemos que hacer tesoro desde la pedagogía, desde el punto de vista educativo. Muchas gracias. A ustedes, muchas gracias. Sí, gracias. Es, en, al final de, la, de las presentaciones y hay un momento de debate y usted puede estar para también responder a algunas preguntas. Muchas gracias. Adesso dovrebbe essere la professoressa Vania Cheng che non si è connettata. Allora possiamo passare all'Australia perché l'Australia ha mandato un video, poi lei dovrebbe essere anche presente ma ha preferito così per evitare problemi di connessione. Allora possiamo passare subito. Non so, neanche lei è in, è in linea, però possiamo già cominciare a, a, ad ascoltare ciò che lei ci propone. E mentre stanno preparando, posso già fare la presentazione. Avete sul programma il professor, la professoressa e poi Jacinta Collins, che più che professoressa in questo momento è l'onorevole, è stata ex senatrice australiana in servizio per un periodo di 25 anni in numerosi portafogli parlamentari, tra cui, sono tanti, ma tra cui segretaria parlamentare per l'istruzione scolastica, le relazioni lavorative, e il Ministero per la Salute Mentale e l'Invecchiamento. L'Onorevole è attualmente segretaria esecutiva della Commissione Episcopale per l'Educazione Cattolica e membro di diverse commissioni che si occupano dell'educazione in Australia. Sono tantissime, non, non ne cito. E le ci offre una riflessione dal titolo Confronting the challenges of education today, an Australian perspective. Thank you for the opportunity to present an Australian perspective on confronting the challenges of education today, and to Mr. Woden and other respondents for presenting their perspectives. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to all Indigenous peoples. It's important to consider the role of Catholic education in the establishment of formal schooling in Australia. The history of Australian education is not well recorded and the first schools being established around three decades ago after colonial settlement in 1788. The first official Catholic school was founded around the same time in 1820 by Irish Catholic priest, Father John Terry, and run by former convict George Marley in Parramatta near Sydney. The school taught 31 students, seven of whom were Protestants. In 1885, Australian Catholic bishops named their intention for a Catholic school to be provided in every parish to educate children in the faith and to contribute to the common good. Catholic schools grew alongside their public school counterparts and established a parallel school system in Australia without any government funding or support for over a century. The reintroduction of funding by the Menzies government in 1962 was a response to a protest by a local bishop who could not afford to comply with building repairs for its local school. The re-establishment of government funding recognised the moral responsibility of governments to fund, at least in part, the education of all Australian children, including those who had been excluded based on their choice of a religious school, and also acknowledge the significant contribution of Catholic schools to the public good. Catholic education in Australia has grown to become the largest schooling provider outside of government. Today, we educate one in five students, over 785,000 students in 1,755 schools with over 102,000 staff. 
Catholic schooling is a $14 billion annual enterprise, and we invest nearly $1.8 billion into capital infrastructure annually. Australian governments contribute around 80% of all recurrent funding annually, with parents and other sources of income making up around 20%. Australia is quite unique in its provision and scope of Catholic education in the world. Education for the common good lies at the heart of Catholic education across the world, a vision shared by the United Nations. In 2015, UNESCO reaffirmed a humanistic approach to education. Education alone cannot hope to solve all development challenges, they said, but a humanistic and holistic approach to education can and should contribute to achieving a new developmental model. In such a model, economic growth must be guided by environmental stewardship and by concern for peace, inclusion and social justice. Regarding education and learning, it means going beyond narrow utilitarianism and economism to integrate the multiple dimensions of the human existence. This vision is echoed in the recent Alice Springs or Mapartway Education Declaration for Australian Schools, which says our education system must do more than this. It must also prepare young people to thrive in a time of rapid social and technological change and complex environmental, social and economic challenges. Education plays a vital role in promoting the intellectual, physical, social, emotional, moral, spiritual and aesthetic development and well-being of young Australians and in ensuring the nation's ongoing economic prosperity and social cohesion. In their recent pastoral letter, the Australian Catholic bishops noted the contribution of Catholic schools to the common good. Catholic schools are also a major part, they say, of Australia's educational ecosystem. They have provided high quality education to generations of young Australians now numbering in their millions. They stand as a beacon in our society for their contribution to the common good and to the nation's social capital. They've helped nurture a more just, tolerant and cohesive society. Catholic education is determined in its commitment to excellence and equity. Now, it's not enough to hold a vision for education that contributes to the common good. We need to measure our success in this endeavour. There is sound evidence that shows education has a positive impact on physical and mental health, increases social cohesion, reduces crime rates and lowers welfare spending, which in turn strengthens civil society. In 2020, Cardiff Education Survey Australia Consortium and the McCrindle Research published their findings on the impact of Australian education on millennials, and specifically how education has contributed to the flourishing of Australian communities. The survey of 25 to 39 year olds explored the extent to which these contributions are evident many years after students have graduated across a range of social, civic, cultural, academic and spiritual outcomes. It found Christian school graduates are far more likely than government school graduates to believe their school prepared them to find a sense of meaning, purpose and direction in life. Where 87% of Catholic and 80% of Christian school graduates were more likely to believe their school emphasised religious or spiritual values than independent, which was 65%, or government graduates at 21%. Now, in 2019, before the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare found one in 10 Australians aged between 24 and 39 were experiencing social isolation and approximately 16% were experiencing loneliness. Research conducted since the pandemic found Australians have been most negatively impacted socially over financial, mental health or physical impacts. Active involvement in groups and associations are not just for economic and psychological reasons, but are fundamental to our good as humans. The Carter survey found large differences in group affiliation with Christian school graduates most likely to be active members of a church or religious group. Government school graduates displayed a lower level of engagement across groups and associations compared to other sectors, but often only marginally. 
more than a quarter of government school graduates are an active member of sports, leisure or cultural group and sports groups are also where Catholic school graduates are most likely to be active members. The common good is fostered through generosity in giving and volunteering. The survey found Christian school graduates volunteer most frequently. Catholic school graduates have high frequencies of giving, and in the previous 12 months, 68% of Catholic school graduates surveyed had donated to a nonprofit charitable organization or group. While Catholic school graduates have highest household incomes, their giving highlights an outward facing approach when it comes to stewarding the resources they have earned. There's a growing body of credible research to suggest religious beliefs and practices such as prayer, meditation, religious moral teaching and practice can be associated with greater mental health and well-being, reduced depression and anxiety, decreased substance use and increased social support. Faith formation is a challenging area to collect data and the National Catholic Education Commission, we are exploring the data available, enhancing the quality of this data and our response to it. The data from the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics 2021 census highlighted a decrease in Australians' identification as Christian. On paper, it showed a drop from 52% to 44% over four years, with no religion rising to 38.9% from 30.1% in 2016. While this doesn't take into account anomalies in the way the Australian census has been collected over the years, the understanding of spiritual belief alongside religious affiliation or a strong secular campaign to tick no religion at the last census, it does show the challenge for policymakers and faith-based groups in advocating for support for religious freedom, faith-based schooling and policy representation. We know from our own polling survey ahead of the last Australian government election in 2022 that the majority of Australians continue to support faith-based schools with 63% of the general population and 82% of Catholics, and indeed 79% of parents with children in Catholic schools, agreeing that religious schools are entitled to require employees to act in their roles that uphold the ethos and the values of that faith, and that they should be free to favour hiring employees that share their values. How we measure the impact of schools on spiritual and religious affiliation is complex. Christian school graduates are the most likely to believe in God, while more government school graduates don't. Christian school graduates are more likely to have prayed, engaged in a religious text, or attended a religious service, at least monthly, in the past 12 months. Interestingly, while Catholic school graduates believe their school has an emphasis on spiritual and religious values, only 16% of Catholic school graduates had attended a religious service at least monthly in the past 12 months. There is a tension that exists between faith formation and contributing to the common good that is reflected in the diversity of those we enrol and their connection to faith, parish life and active worship. For Catholic schools, our partnership with parishes back in 1885 is as important today and our schools are one of our strongest opportunities to evangelise and to continue to be fertile ground to enrich faith formation and religious education. Now, the level of education attainment has been shown to have a direct impact on individuals' health, with adults scoring lower literacy proficiency being more likely to report poor health. Conversely, better educated people have lower morbidity rates and longer life expectancy. A pressing concern for all Australian schools, not just Catholic, is how we will reverse a 20-year decline in student performance as measured by the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment, uh, or PISA, and other local assessment measures which show an absolute relative decline in performance. This decline cannot be attributed to one particular school sector, but is a challenge shared across the whole education landscape here, and particularly for students experience educational disadvantage and those from rural and remote areas. As part of our strategic focus, we are working with states, territories, dioceses and school communities to understand the national picture and we're looking at highly effective schools across the Catholic and other sectors to identify and share best practice. While the initial focus is on numeracy and maths, where there is significant need according to our national data, we will also continue this work with reading and writing, 
This work will support local efforts to lift educational standards across Catholic systems. Our systemness is our greatest asset to share expertise and learn from each other in order to lift educational outcomes for all students. In our earliest days, Catholic schools were originally established to educate the poor and most vulnerable in society. While the preferential option for the poor is still a valued aspiration for Catholic education, we have increasingly found ourselves victim of our own success and being more accessible to families from middle-class backgrounds. With government schools carrying more of the load in regard to educational and social ec economic disadvantage. We know that students from lower income backgrounds, students with disability, the Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander students are underrepresented in our schools. There are a number of reasons for this, including limited capital support to grow and build new Catholic schools. However, we also need to consider how we can remove barriers to enrolment to be more welcoming and inclusive and to better meet the needs of students and families from all backgrounds. At our National Catholic Education Conference earlier this month, Director of Education and Skills at the OECD, Andrea Schleicher, said the findings from the PISA assessment have demonstrated that education can moderate social disadvantage. However, he acknowledges the performance variability between schools. Mr Schleicher says performance variability between schools is less a concern in countries like Finland and even Australia, where he says we're actually performing quite well. However, there is a huge variability in student performance within schools in Australia. And it's not just disadvantaged students from disadvantaged areas. There are many young people falling through the cracks, even in high performing and wealthy schools, which is a much harder problem to address and requires more attention on what is happening within the whole education system. One area where Australia does well is to provide disadvantaged students with access to high performing schools. Mr. Schleicher says, if you have good results and merit, you can access a high performing school in Australia. The system is very porous. Social segregation in Australia is not a story of public versus private schools. He says, most of the social segregation in Australia is actually happening within the public school sector. That's where the big problems of social segregation arise or even also within the private sector it's not so much a question of public versus private schools. So it's a question for the entire school system. The recent plenary council in Australia provided an opportunity to renew our focus on the educational mission of the church. Unfortunately, sometimes this was overshadowed by other active voices and agendas, which left many of us thinking we had missed an opportunity to give formal support to our Alice Springs Mapartway education declaration and highlight issues of excellence and equity. Nonetheless, this will not diminish our national strategic priorities to enrich the faith lives of students, support the continual improvement of student learning outcomes and improve access to Catholic education for all students. Finally, I want to acknowledge the work of teachers and leaders in Australian education. The COVID-19 pandemic has in some ways better highlighted the need and value of the teaching profession in Australia. Without a quality teaching profession, our educational aims cannot be achieved. Australia, like many places in the world, is challenged by teacher workforce shortages, particularly in specialist subject areas and regional and remote areas. We are working in partnership with our Catholic universities and the wider tertiary sector to identify new opportunities for strengthening the teacher workforce, building connections with today's students to consider teaching as a profession, and to strengthen initial teacher education. We are also looking at how we can form our teachers and leaders in faith and maintain our Catholic identity in a legislative environment focused on limiting religious freedom in some Australian states and territories. At our recent conference, in a very entertaining cooking segment with a hospitality student and their teacher, Archbishop of Sydney, Anthony Fisher, said the recipe for success for Australian Catholic education and one could say education more broadly, can be equated to a well-baked souffle. He said the ingredients need to be right and all parts of the souffle need to rise, the bottom, the middle and the top, otherwise the whole souffle will flop. Education has the ability to mobilise future generations, to lift them out of poverty and disadvantage, as the early Australian Catholic educators succeeded, and to foster the human flourishing of all young people. For Catholic education, we describe this 
in the words of Jesus, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'd like to finish by sharing what our bishops wrote in their recent pastoral letter. We also have great confidence in our young people that inspired by their encounter with Jesus Christ and nurtured by a Catholic education, they will be young women and men of character and ideals and will contribute as leaders and disciples in our world. And we have great confidence in our education leaders and staff that in charting the course of Catholic education in Australia, in its third century, you will help us imagine how our educational institutions can be schools in a deeper faith and humanity and ensure that this dream is realised. Congratulations on your 150th anniversary, and I hope this Congress bears rich fruit for our ongoing work in Catholic education. Bene, I don't know if uh, Jacinta Collins is there. We want to thank you so much for your thoughts, your reflection about Catholic education in Australia. It's very interesting, the last, the last um, phrase, uh, we, we believe in the future. This is the education. E adesso, solo per guadagnare tempo, abbiamo la nostra professoressa Smerilli che è in presenza. Lei era l'ultima, ma cominciamo a, ad accogliere lei, siccome le altre non ci sono ancora. È vero che conosciamo bene su Alessandra, ma noblesse oblige. <ride> Dobbiamo fare un, una piccola presentazione. E sappiamo che la professoressa Alessandra Smerilli è segretaria del Dicastero per il Servizio dello Sviluppo Umano Integrale della Città del Vaticano economista, docente di economia politica e statistica presso la Pontificia Facoltà di Scienze dell'Educazione Auxilium, ha insegnato anche economia, etica e finanza presso altre università. Nel 2021 Papa Francesco l'ha nominato sottosegretario per il settore fede e sviluppo del Dicastero per il servizio dello sviluppo umano integrale, poi segretario dello stesso Dicastero. È autrice di numerosi volumi sull'economia di comunione e collabora a diverse istituzioni nazionali e internazionali. Ci offre una breve riflessione, un po' dandoci il punto di vista dell'Europa, il contributo delle figlie di Maria Auxiliatrice all'educazione in Europa oggi. A, a lei la parola, Alessandra. Prova, si sente? Bene. Innanzitutto grazie per eh, questo invito, sono molto felice di essere qui ed è un momento di, di gioia ma anche un momento intenso poter essere qui a riflettere sulle sfide dell'educazione in Europa. Come dicevamo eh, ci vorrebbe un seminario a parte per ogni continente ma... Eh, Possiamo darci degli spunti e soprattutto delle domande, perché penso che siamo qui per farci domande, non per avere risposte. E nel ringraziarvi per l'invito, innanzitutto chiedo scusa ai traduttori, perché ogni tanto mi sgancerò dal testo, ma so che sono molto bravi. Nel ringraziarvi per l'invito condivido innanzitutto la gioia di sentirmi a casa. Il servizio alla Chiesa Universale che mi è stato chiesto non cancella la mia storia, anzi 
approfondisce l'appartenenza al nostro istituto che compie 150 anni. Seppure chiamata molto presto, proprio dal nostro istituto, a dedicarmi alle scienze economiche, credo che il carisma educativo è capace di illuminare dall'interno ogni impegno e incarico, in particolare in due modi, mantenendo i giovani dentro l'orizzonte e suggerendo che ad ogni età siamo persone in fieri, chiamate sempre a, di, a, eh, e di nuovo a venire al mondo. Come può un uomo nascere quando è vecchio? chiede Nicodemo a Gesù. E Gesù dice anche a noi che è possibile. Un secolo e mezzo alle spalle, sulle spalle non ci impedisce di essere giovani se rinasciamo dall'acqua e dallo spirito, se la parola e i sacramenti hanno efficacia in noi e non c'è disconnessione tra fede, scelte istituzionali, economiche, educative e pastorali. Il tempo che ci è dato di vivere l'abbiamo sentito, quindi non mi dilungo su questo, è un tempo di cambiamento epocale e per il continente europeo, specialmente determinato dall'accelerazione dell'innovazione tecnologica, che pervade quasi senza confini la nostra esistenza familiare, sociale, lavorativa, lo studio, soprattutto la vita dei giovani e la loro percezione della realtà. E sappiamo quello che si è susseguito negli ultimi anni, in parte in comune con tutto il mondo, in parte eh, quello che sta capitando adesso in Ucraina, che è particolare per l'Europa. Abbiamo già sentito che eh, è uno dei più grandi esodi di massa della storia, soprattutto di donne e bambini. E questo è lo scenario in cui le nostre giovani e i nostri giovani si affacciano alla vita. E allora ci chiediamo che cosa significa educare in Europa, che contributo possiamo dare come figlie di Maria Ausiliatrice. La questione è complessa e le risposte continueranno a nascere dal basso, in modo sinodale, dialogando fra vocazioni e generazioni. Dall'osservatorio particolare che mi ho offerto in questa fase della mia vita suggerisco alcuni punti. Sono come delle soglie da non evitare, anche se ci vedono spesso titubanti, incerti sul fare un passo in avanti o indietro. Numero uno, sono tre, i giovani europei, ma tutti i giovani, hanno un tipo di intelligenza che non appartiene alle precedenti generazioni. È fortemente segnata dal funzionamento della rete e dalla cultura democratica. È un'intelligenza orizzontale che procede per immagini e per connessioni. Non è un'intelligenza gerarchica e logico-deduttiva. È una nuova forma mentis, molto aperta, libera e flessibile. Apparentemente fragile, ma potenzialmente disponibile a infiniti incontri. Questo dovrebbe sposarsi con aspetti tipici della cattolicità, che significa inclusione, universalità, comunione fra diversi. Si scontra però con molta parte della nostra dottrina e delle nostre abitudini, anche educative e di insegnamento. Perché? Perché sono figlie di un tipo di intelligenza diversa. Per intendersi occorre frequentarsi, dare fiducia, fare spazio, voler capire, simpatizzare. Occorre anche riconoscere come siamo cambiati noi, forse senza accorgercene, a motivo della stessa cultura, che magari non ci appartiene consapevolmente, ma è aria che respiriamo. In generale, meno regole, più possibilità. Anche di sbagliare. 
perché da tutto ci si riprende e si impara. A questo tipo di intelligenza si accompagna tanta paura di fallire e sbagliare, perché sembra non avere bordi e confini, sembra accompagnarsi a identità fragili. A noi è chiesto di saperne vedere le potenzialità, rialzare chi è caduto, ammorbidire chi si rigidisce, senza nostalgie. Punto numero due, i giovani europei hanno più chiaro degli adulti che quella climatica è una sfida epocale, che chiede la conversione ecologica di cui parla Papa Francesco. Essa comporta una diversa rappresentazione di noi stessi nell'universo e fra gli altri esseri viventi, ieri parlavamo di spazio a proposito di universo, un nuovo rapporto tra comportamento e scienza, una messa in discussione dell'attuale assetto economico e dei suoi reali rapporti con la politica. Questo tipo di consapevolezza cerca nuove forme di partecipazione alla vita pubblica, un risveglio del bisogno di contribuire come onesti cittadini alla modificazione della realtà sociale, in un quadro di grave crisi della credibilità delle democrazie e delle loro classi dirigenti, spesso anche a livello locale. Insieme alla Chiesa, che cosa possiamo fare per sostenere l'aggregarsi e il protagonismo giovanile? Come possiamo approfondire con i giovani e per i giovani una nuova rappresentazione del rapporto col creato e fra gli esseri viventi? Sappiamo che Laudato Si e Fratelli Tutti possono essere testi di riferimento importanti per questo nuovo patto educativo globale che possiamo, come figlie di Maria Ausiliatrice, cominciare e continuare a tessere. Terzo punto... I giovani europei sono spesso accusati di analfabetismo religioso, di perdita di senso, ma di fatto forse ci chiedono di comprendere che la nostra testimonianza potrebbe non essere più eloquente. La presenza di decine di migliaia di religiosi, di milioni di cristiani in Europa, la miriade di segni architettonici e artistici che caratterizzano il paesaggio urbano. Chi viene da fuori nota subito che le nostre città sono costruite in un certo modo, che i segni religiosi fanno parte del nostro tessuto. Le molteplici realtà ecclesiastiche ed educative attive nel vecchio continente sembrano non parlare non attrarre, non convincere. Evangelii Gaudium è un'esortazione apostolica che da dieci anni sollecita un'inversione ad U nella missione, ad U nel senso di conversione. Papa Francesco ci chiede di piegare la Chiesa alle persone reali. E l'esortazione apostolica post-sinodale Christus Vivit approfondisce tutto questo per i giovani. Significa che loro sono il punto di partenza, non quelli che già incontriamo, ma quelli che esistono e fra i quali il risorto ci precede. Il punto di partenza non sono i nostri 150 anni, le cose che abbiamo sin qui costruito e fatto, ma quello che le persone soffrono, sognano, pensano, progettano, contestano adesso. Uscire e capire, ascoltare e prendere sul serio, rileggere il Vangelo e i nostri fondatori partendo da quello che c'è, da quello che esiste, non da quello che non c'è più i nostri nipoti, i nostri ex alunni, chiunque incontriamo, che cosa pensano, dove sono, cosa ci fanno capire meglio del Vangelo. Quando nel Sinodo dicevamo che i giovani per noi sono un luogo teologico, è proprio questo, chiederci cosa 
ci mostrano del Vangelo. Prima di avere qualcosa da dare, abbiamo qualcosa da ricevere. E in questo senso mi piace eh, testimoniare quello che stiamo vivendo adesso nel nostro dicastero per lo sviluppo umano integrale che tanto ha a che fare anche con l'educazione, eh, sebbene c'è un altro dicastero che si occupi di educazione, ma sappiamo che l'educazione è integrale. E, da, Dall'uscita dell'Evangelii dell Gaudium, la riforma della Curia Romana, dove c'è un principio fondamentale, ce cioè ne sono vari, ma uno è importante, è che la curia romana è a servizio, non è una struttura di mediazione, ma è una struttura a servizio del Papa e delle chiese locali. Allora noi abbiamo pensato come possiamo, come organizzazione, ripensarci perché possiamo essere realmente a servizio. E quindi abbiamo rivoluzionato completamente l'organizzazione, eh, in che modo? Strutturandoci in tre grandi gruppi. Il primo e più grande gruppo è il gruppo chiamato Ascolto e Dialogo, dove abbiamo persone che hanno la responsabilità di essere in costante contatto con i Vescovi, con le organizzazioni religiose, con tutti. Ieri eravamo in, con un gruppo di Vescovi brasiliani, e la persona responsabile dell'America Latina ha chiesto che subito dopo l'incontro ci si scambiassero i contatti Whatsapp perché non dobbiamo essere una chiesa burocratica ma una chiesa in perenne atteggiamento sinodale di ascolto e di dialogo. Quando Papa Francesco ci ha chiesto di dar vita al nostro dicastero ha lasciato tre parole, l'abbiamo detto anche ieri sera, ascoltare, ascoltare ascoltare. E eh, poi c'è una sezione di ricerca, riflessione e discernimento che deve elaborare, perché l'ascolto deve portarci poi a elaborare, a riflettere alla luce del Vangelo e quindi restituire una sezione di comunicazione e restituzione. Ma mh, quello che sto cominciando a vivere, per questo voglio condividerlo con voi, è che ehm, quando io mi sono sempre chiesta, quando Papa Francesco nell'Evangelii Gaudium parla delle nostre programmazioni e di come devono essere differenti dal fare piani a tavolini, mi chiedevo ma come funziona, come succede? Ecco, lo sto sperimentando. Noi quando ci presentiamo ai Vescovi diciamo che il nostro dicastero è il dicastero dell'eccetera perché noi diciamo ci occupiamo di diritti umani, di economia, di ecologia, di salute, di sicurezza, di... eccetera, eccetera. Vogliamo essere il dicastero dell'eccetera perché l'eccetera è quello che voi portate a noi, è quello che ci ponete anche come peso sulle nostre spalle e quindi l'eccetera diventerà la nostra agenda. Noi non vogliamo definire le priorità dell'anno perché le priorità saranno definite da quello che ci verrà consegnato. E già ci stiamo orientando, dopo i primi ascolti di tanti vescovi dell'America Latina, ci stanno consegnando un problema molto grave, che è quello della violenza, dei soprusi, soprattutto tra i giovani, e il tema educativo perché si riesca in qualche modo a cambiare. E allora l'accogliamo e questa diventa una nostra priorità, non quello che abbiamo pensato, non prendere un punto della laudato sì e dire per quest'anno questo è il nostro programma, ma dire questo è quello che sta a cuore a te, noi lo rileggiamo alla luce della laudato sì, della Fratelli Tutti, e lo riconsegniamo come servizio e accompagnamento chiudo perché mi sono dilungata, eh, questi sono alcuni spunti perché questo convegno vuole essere un incontro di ascolto, dialogo e dove le risposte poi si cercano insieme. Non posso non concludere se non facendo cenno alla luce di tutto quello che abbiamo ascoltato e delle poche cose che ho provato a dire all'incontro dei giovani di Assisi con Papa Francesco, questo grande processo mondiale 
eh, che eh, è sta, vi invito per chi non ha seguito, c'è tutto in streaming, l'evento di sabato, eh, credo uno che il discorso di Papa Francesco sia proprio da, da meditare e due capire l'atmosfera e capire cosa vuol dire un processo di giovani che per tre anni hanno lavorato quasi praticamente da soli dove noi adulti eravamo lì solo a, ad ascoltare e a, ad aiutarli quando fosse necessario e loro ci cercavano, non eravamo noi che ci, impone, ci imponevamo e quando dicevamo questo tipo di intelligenza che non appartiene alle precedenti generazioni, i giovani pur non essendosi mai visti, perché si sono visti per la prima volta dopo tre anni ad Assisi, hanno saputo costruire reti e reti non astratte perché ad Assisi hanno portato i loro progetti, imprese, fattorie, messe insieme tra giovani di tutto il mondo che lavorando su determinati temi hanno dato vita a opere. E io penso che questo sia un segno grande di speranza anche a livello educativo. Papa Francesco ha creduto in loro perché è stato lui a scrivere la lettera che li ha eh, chiamati e continua a ripetere voi non siete il futuro, voi siete il presente. Credo che questa è la consapevolezza che ci deve guidare per rispondere alle sfide educative. Grazie. Grazie alla professoressa Smerili per questi, per questi spunti che ci ha dato. Voi mi avete visto un po' agitata perché stavo cercando di risolvere il problema perché le due altre non riescono a entrare. E adesso ho mandato ancora un ultimo messaggio perché dicevo, parlavo un po' con la signora dell'Africa e dice l'Africa non può mancare, è, è vero, manca l'Africa e l'Asia. Adesso abbiamo mandato un ultimo messaggio e speriamo che riescano a risolvere perché loro erano nello streaming volendo entrare da un po' di tempo. E, sì. e nel frattempo Possiamo, perché adesso abbiamo finito e l'insieme mancano queste due, vediamo se riusciamo a, a farli entrare e potrebbe iniziare il dibattito per non perdere il tempo nell'assemblea. Allora, la professoressa Giulia Paola Di Nicola modera un po' questo dibattito, nel frattempo vedo se riesco a sistemare perché abbiamo fatto le prove insieme e ho io i, i contatti e siccome parlano altre lingue bisogna stare dietro un attimo e possiamo iniziare. Ecco. Se ci sono le domande online e potete anche farli passare. Bravissima, Sor Marta, qua nel destreggiarsi con tutte queste cose, questi impegni. E adesso, forse sono insieme, sì. Quindi mi affida il compito che era suo, comunque è semplicemente un compito di sollecitazione, se ci sono domande, se ci sono interventi, aggiunte, critiche, notazioni varie. È stato tutto molto vario e interessante, quindi a voi la parola se ci sono online non so chi è che le manda se ci sono online ah sono lì ma vabbè ok ecco non vedo domande online quindi se ci sono in diretta Attendiamo, approfittando del tempo che abbiamo. Eh, vedo qualcuno che ha alzato la mano. Ecco. Buongiorno. Eh, ringrazio davvero per la mattinata che ci è stata offerta come tanti stimoli, tanti spunti per riflettere, per interiorizzare 
davvero i contenuti. Ci vorrebbe un altro seminario per far silenzio e sedimentare davvero e eh, prendere consapevolezza maggiore per quanto ci è stato dato. Eh, volevo soffermarmi eh, su una parola che la professoressa eh, Smerilli ha messo in evidenza e per me è estremamente nuova sull'eccetera <ride> questo eccetera che noi nel nostro linguaggio comune <ride> almeno usiamo davvero tanto eccetera eccetera cosa vuol dire eccetera eccetera questa mattina ho avuto una eh, risposta più significativa però la mia domanda e non so se può essere una domanda o una considerazione come stare in questo eccetera in questo tempo che ci viene chiesto di essere in questo tempo che ci viene chiesto di fare in questo tempo che ci viene chiesto di raccontare di manifestare ma l'eccetera è tanto è tanto oltre a quello che in ognuno di noi magari viene, si fa chiaro nella nostra testa, nel nostro agire, parlo anche di noi gruppo ex allieve presente nel territorio e che vogliamo essere, desideriamo essere presenza significativa di un quanto raccolto, di quanto ci, viene, ci è stato donato a nostro tempo come, come stile educativo. Così, volevo soffermarmi su questo, eccetera, eccetera, eccetera. Grazie. Prego, è sua la parola. Ma si sente? Prova? Pure è acceso. Si sente? Ok. Ehm, grazie innanzitutto. Ok, ma così al volo mi, mi vengono alcune sollecitazioni su come stare in questo eccetera anche alla luce dell'esperienza che, che stiamo facendo. Eh, uno, riprendo le parole che Papa Francesco ha detto ad Assisi ai giovani, non lasciateci tranquilli, per stare in questo eccetera bisogna essere pronti a, a cambiare, una delle caratteristiche deve essere l'agilità, la flessibilità, il cogliere e, eh, ed essere pronti a stare accanto. Poi mi, viene, eh, mi, mi, torna, mi risuona da questa mattina dalla preghiera eh, la citazione di Martini, la consapevolezza che Dio che educa il suo popolo e quindi che noi che non tutto dipende da noi che noi collaboriamo ad un'azione più grande penso che questo ci dia tanta pace e poi e questa è l'esperienza che stiamo facendo anche in Dicastero non tutto possiamo farlo noi nel senso che voi pensate un Dicastero come il nostro che si occupa di tutto dovremmo avere non so quante persone che lavorano con noi e per quanto brave non sarebbero mai in grado di essere sempre sulla frontiera e quindi abbiamo deciso di avere una persona con noi e intorno a questa persona un network di tantissime persone in tutto il mondo che possono dare apporti e contribuire lo sappiamo e ce lo diciamo non è più il tempo di lavorare da soli e ci è chiesto veramente adesso di far diventare le reti con cui possiamo condividere effettive, efficaci, perché è solo insieme che possiamo stare in questo mondo che è anche molto fluido. Ce l'abbiamo fatta? Sì, chiedo scusa, ma ci sono questioni tecnologiche qua da dirimere. Ecco, ci sono due domande nella chat eh, per Wodon, professor Wodon. Lei ha evidenziato, prima domanda, come l'educazione e istruzione può aiutare a diminuire le gravidanze precoci in alcune parti del mondo. Ma noi in Europa assistiamo alla crisi per la diminuzione delle nascite. Come possiamo spiegare tale crisi? Come l'educazione e istruzione può rispondere a questa sfida? A lei, professore, tanto più che Papa Francesco ormai più volte... Eh, prime su questo punto debole dell'Europa 
È collegato professor Rodon? No. Help, help please. <ride> Sì, ce n'è un'altra, però è sempre lo stesso professore, quindi... Eh, ah no, no, questa è Suora Alessandra, vorrei sapere dall'esperienza che stai vivendo nel Dicastero che suggerimenti daresti alle nostre ispettorie comunità? Questa è proprio di famiglia, una domanda. Questo è troppo difficile se voglio essere coerente con quello che ho detto, nel senso che per dare suggerimenti bisogna esserci, stare, condividere nella carne e da lì vedere quello che, che emerge. Quindi l'unico suggerimento è, è per le superiore ascoltare, ascoltare, ascoltare. <ride> E per tutti e tutte prendersi la responsabilità con i giovani di fare lo stesso. Ok, grazie, ascoltare. Suora, prego. Sono Sorpina. Allora, grazie per quello che abbiamo ascoltato. Eh, mi domandavo, eh, questa, questa è una domanda che ci siamo posti in questi giorni. È importante esserci, abbiamo detto, esserci dentro questo contesto importante per educare e per comprendere e per esserci abbiamo sentito stamattina ancora è importante ascoltare ma eh, la mia domanda eh, che rivolgo a me stessa ma a noi tutti per essere capaci di ascoltare ci vuole formazione e in questi giorni è, risu è risuonata molto questa parola, cioè siamo preparati ad affrontare queste sfide, mm -hmm. cioè com'è la nostra preparazione, soprattutto pensando a questi cambiamenti di paradigmi, eh? paradigmi di pensiero, ma che poi sono paradigmi anche di azione, di modelli educativi e formativi che sono cambiati. E questa formazione, eh, cioè ascoltare, esige avere dei criteri che ci permettono... Eh, che guidano in fondo il nostro ascolto eh, e, e questi criteri da dove ci vengono sono le chiavi di lettura per, per una comprensione eh, del contesto globale e delle persone. Allora la domanda è sempre questa, cioè come ci attrezziamo per prepararci, per qualificarci non a un futuro lontano ma all'oggi, cioè al domani, 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 domani mattina. Eh, questa è un'urgenza molto forte che la sentiamo che è risuonata molto forte nell'assemblea eh, e quindi non so se, se è una domanda che esige una risposta ma solo per riflettere insieme su questo allora mi cede la parola eh, ed è sempre un problema fondamentale chi formerà i formatori insomma e eh, quindi è questione di qualità è stato detto anche oggi però eh, sì, ascoltare tutte cose positive, come ha detto giustamente, è una condivisione, non è tanto una domanda. Io vorrei aggiungere un aspetto un po', diciamo, non so, un po' misterioso, che non si impara. Nel senso che c'è un quid che scatta nella capacità di educare in una persona, che eh, boh, forse fa parte del suo talento, del suo genio, della sua vocazione, cioè, ma vale per Don Bosco e vale per tanti. Cioè, uno, certamente, eh, come diceva il professor Rudo, eh, ci sono tantissimi skills, no? come si dicono oggi, tantissime abilità da apprendere e sulle quali non c'è adeguata preparazione, quindi è difficile avere poi... Tutto questo è un lavoro da fare, ma senza quel quid lì, è difficile perché quello riguarda un aspetto relazionale su cui forse avete parlato negli altri giorni, oggi mi pare un po' meno. Cioè tutti noi abbiamo il ricordo di qualcuno che in rapporto a noi ha stabilito quel, quel, quel quid no? e, e con cui siamo cresciuti e, e, e che fa, queste persone fanno parte del, hanno impastato il nostro modo di essere. E questo chi ce lo insegnerà? Eh, ci vuole un po' l'intuizione del momento un po' eh, la, la capacità innata e un po' forse lo Spirito Santo che ci dà quel, 
quella scintilla di, di entrare nel cuore dell'altro in punta di piedi e conquistarlo. Eh, a volte penso che il cristianesimo è anche un'arte di conquista, il che mi riabilita un po' quella delle donne. <ride> cioè è di entrare nell'anima perché l'anima venga a te, l'anima, la persona, e, e dopo si appianano. Io non so, dico solo, faccio una sfumatura a quello che già lei ha ben detto. Bene, abbiamo recuperato la professoressa Avagna e dopo speriamo di recuperare l'altra. Dopo continueremo la, il dibattito. Allora, la professoressa Avagna ha due parole. Vagna Shang è professore di ecclesiologia al Holy Spirit Seminary College of Theology and Philosophy in Hong Kong. È focolarina dell'Opera di Maria, è impegnata a diversi livelli internazionali nello sviluppo del movimento e nel, nel, del tema del dialogo interreligioso. Offre una risonanza asiatica sulle sfide che si ripercuotono sull'educazione e sui processi in atto dal titolo Education in response to the challenges of humanity today in the Asian context. Ascoltiamola, che l'abbiamo aspettato tanto. <laughs> and uh, welcome, you. welcome, sister, uh, welcome, uh, Vanya. <laughs> you have uh, the word, okay. <laughs>
Thank you so much for your, your speech. Very touch, very profound, no? E faremo tesoro di ciò che tu, hai, tu ci hai dato oggi. E adesso finalmente possiamo anche ascoltare la professoressa Albertin. C'è? Sì, io sono là. Est-ce che voi mi attendete? Vous êtes là? Sì. Ma noi vogliamo vous voir. Io sono là. Ah, oh, bon, finalement. Okay. <laughs> oui, oui. Okay. <laughs> finalement, eh, on a fatigué oh, beaucoup. Voilà. Donc, je dis deux mots et rapidement de présentation et puis nous vous donnons la parole. Donc, je le dis en italien parce que vous le savez déjà. Comme ça, le public peut mieux comprendre. Donc, la professeure Albertine Chilibondi Goyi est philosophe et sociologue fondatrice del Centro d'Etudes, Centro Studi Africane e di Ricerche Interculturali. È la prima donna africana congolese che è dottore in filosofia dell'Istituto Superiore di Filosofia all'Università Cattolica di Louvain, Louvain le Neuve, in Belgio, e anche delle facoltà cattoliche di Kinshasa, oggi che è un'università cattolica del Congo. Ha ugualmente conseguito il dottorato in scienze sociali presso l'Università Libre, l'Università Libre di Bruxelles, con una tesi su femme, genre, education e développement in Africa. Le sue pubblicazioni sono numerose sul tema della donna e della donna africana. Offre, adesso ci offre la risonanza dal punto di vista del continente africano. Donc, vous avez la parole.
Merci. Merci beaucoup, professeur. Vous nous avez sollicité en beaucoup de points, mais malheureusement, on n'a pas le temps du débat parce que maintenant, ce serait le moment le plus intéressant voir la réaction du, de l'Assemblée, mais malheureusement, le temps est expiré. Il nous faut pas continuer l'horaire prévu et au cours de notre, de notre Assemblée. Donc, nous avons d'autres rencontres très engageantes qui nous attendent dans, dans l'après-midi. Merci beaucoup pour votre apport. Et avec les capitaux par la tenue française, que ormai abbiamo, abbiamo superato il tempo di molto e ci aspettano nel refettorio, dobbiamo andare. Allora, ringraziamo perché sarebbe adesso il momento in cui davvero l'Assemblea potrebbe svegliarsi per le domande, per discutere, ma non c'è il tempo. Speriamo che questo pomeriggio il relatore sarà sul posto e che le cose vanno eh, più nella regola come orario. Comunque ringrazio molto, abbiamo avuto, ieri c'è stata la domanda a Sopiera Cavalia, quali sono le sfide al sistema preventivo oggi e Sopiera ci aveva detto, il congresso vi proporrà le sfide. Penso che oggi abbiamo ricevuto tantissime sfide e questo pomeriggio ritorneranno e spero di poter, che possiamo discuterne tra di noi. Allora, grazie per l'attenzione. Grazie.